Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Brooklyn Rail's 85th New Social Environment. I'm Madeline, and I have the absolute pleasure of being your MC today for a conversation with photographer Dewu Bay, hosted by critic and curator Lyle Rexer. We're also thrilled to have poet Farnoosh Fati here, who will read to close today's program. Uh, it's almost hard to believe that this is our 85th daily conversation since we began this series in mid-March, and we're all so grateful to have you here today. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces over the weeks. Lyle Rexer is an independent critic, curator, and writer. He is the author of numerous books, essays, and articles on art, architecture, and photography, and is a regular columnist for Photograph Magazine. He lives in Brooklyn and teaches at the School of Visual Arts. Uh, Lyle, I will now hand it over to you, to you and to Wood. Thanks, Madeline. Thanks so much. Uh, and, and thank you, Dawood, uh, for being with me. You, Dawood's in Chicago. I'm in Brooklyn, I believe. Uh, I wanted to introduce Dawood. This is a conversation uh, I've been eager to have probably for 20 years. And for some reason, it never happened until now, uh, now that we can't actually talk to each other. Yeah. Dawood is a well-known, by, by now, well-known artist. He's a and a Guggenheim Fellow, MacArthur Fellow in 2017. He's an NEA grantee, uh, got his uh, graduate degree from Yale uh, after a BFA from Empire State College in our SUNY system. Uh, he's had exhibitions at the Studio Museum in Harlem, uh, something that will come up again, uh, the National Gallery, uh, he's, and his retrospective has been at San Francisco MoMA and the Whitney Museum. And this is just a sh very short list of places where he's exhibited. Uh, and he is a, has been a distinguished college artist and is now remains a professor of art uh, at Columbia College in Chicago. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to Daoud and he's brought a number of pictures for us today. And I think we're gonna have a lot of fun. Uh, we have an opportunity to, to look at some of these pictures in detail. Um, Daoud, for some reason, photographers, it's been my experience, are hooked on origin stories, right? I don't know whether it's biblical or what, but they, they always want to begin at the beginning with the first camera and the first photographic experience. So I wonder if you talk to us a little bit about that early experience you had in 1969 at that uh, uh, landmark exhibition at, at the Met called Harlem on My Mind. Okay, certainly. But uh, first, uh, I just want to thank uh, everyone at uh, Brooklyn Rail for uh, inviting me to do this conversation with Lyle uh, today. And as Lyle said, somehow or another over the years, uh, Lyle has, in, in fact, written about my work. But somehow or another, we've never had an extended conversation. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy and uh, grateful uh, to have this opportunity uh, to have this uh, conversation uh, with Lyle. Uh, and as Lyle mentioned, uh, things kind of begin for me uh, in 1969 when I was 16 years old and an exhibition opened at the Metropolitan Museum of Art called Harlem on My Mind. Uh, I have to say that I was not at all interested in or remotely interested in photography uh, at the time that the exhibition opened. Uh, I was at that early stage very socially engaged, socially active uh, from a very early age. Uh, working with the Poor People's Campaign. By then I joined the Black Panther Party and been involved in uh, a number of uh, local organizations that were organizing active resistance around uh, various issues uh, in the late uh, 60s, which of course was a moment of deeply significant social turmoil in America with uh, the war in Vietnam taking place and that overlapping with uh, the, uh, the tail end of the civil rights movement and the beginning of the black power movement and the women's movement. So it was a very 
uh, highly charged moment. And in that moment, uh, as their way of responding to that moment, uh, the Metropolitan Museum mounted an exhibition about Harlem, New York, which of course by that time was a largely African-American community. And the exhibition and the shaping of the exhibition uh, was well-intentioned, but fraught with a number of missteps. Uh, and out of those missteps, uh, when the exhibition opened, uh, there were protests mounted around the exhibition. And those protests initially uh, had to do with uh, the lack of input that the Black community had been allowed to have in the construction of this exhibition that purported to be about their community. And uh, that was one side. On the other side, and I don't want to go into a long history lesson here. I, I highly recommend Susan Kahan's book, uh, uh, which details uh, all of this uh, in, in great detail. The book is called Mounting Frustration. And it's about this moment in relation to museums. So I highly recommend Susan Kahan's book, Mounting Frustration. It gives a, a really deep uh, inside history to this moment. But at any rate, the controversy around the exhibition spilled over into talk radio and local media. And I read about it in uh, my local paper and decided that I wanted to see what the controversy was about. Because I was already socially engaged, so it came on my radar and uh, there were picket lines mounted in front of the museum. Two picket lines, actually. One was the picket lines mounted by people from uh, the Black community, and the other was a picket line mounted by Mayor Kahani, uh, who around that ex exhibition actually formed the Jewish Defense League. The Jewish Defense League came into being at that moment around an essay that had been published in the catalog that uh, Kahani said passed the uh, Jewish community in a very disparaging light in relation to, to Jewish merchants and shopkeepers in Harlem who were seen to be exploiting Harlem. Again, without going into much detail, because the curator butchered the essay, had this young woman who uh, wrote the essay uh, saying things that she hadn't said by taking the quotation off of her quote. But anyway, I heard about these protests, and so I wanted to go see what the controversy was about. I suspect I may have even wanted to get on the picket line, because certainly if I had gotten there and there had been picket lines, I don't know that I would have crossed them to go in and see the exhibition. But as fate would have it, on the day that I got there, there were no picket lines. And that left it open for me to go in and see the exhibition. And uh, I guess I could summarize it by saying it was a transformative moment. The impetus of uh, ordinary African Americans on a wall in a museum. It kind of changed everything for me. And it's also, uh, you can see from the slides that it, it was not a conventional fine art uh, kind of exhibition. Uh, it was a really over the top presentation of this work. But never having gone to a museum to see any exhibition on my own before that, I didn't even think about the presentation of strategies too much. It was more the fact that I was inside of a museum looking at photographs of people that looked like me or people in my family or community, which for me changed the whole notion of what the museum was or 
on what the museum could be. And certainly, the protests at the museum, uh, which were headed up by a group that became, uh, it was a multicultural uh, group of art workers, and the uh, organization uh, took the name of uh, the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition. And it was headed up by an artist, Danny Andrews. So it gave me from the outset uh, a very different sense of what the museum was. That the museum was not a benign space, which I probably thought it was up until that point. That it was a space that could be actively engaged, actively spoken back to. And that the things that existed in the didn't have to be too different from the things that were outside of the wall of the museum. That the larger social construct of the, in this case, the Black community, could be actually brought into the museum and made to be part of uh, what one saw when one visited a museum. So, so, yeah. so that would, for you, when you saw those photographs in, in that exhibition, did you have this idea that it was photography that could be that thing that would translate experience directly to other people? What were you thinking about photographs when you saw these pictures and photography as something you might do? Um, I had, in fact, gotten my first camera from my godmother the year before. Uh, I had no idea what to do with the camera. <laughs> I had no idea what my subject might be. And that exhibition was instrumental in that way as well. It began to give me a sense of what my subject might be. And if you go back to the slide after Harlem on my mind, uh, yeah, the other thing about Harlem on my mind is that my mother and father met there. Uh, I, I have personal history in that community. That's my mother and my aunt in a picture that my father did on Amsterdam Avenue in Harlem. And that's my mother and father up on the roof in uh, Sugar Hill in Harlem, where they live. So it was a combination of uh, the exhibition in the museum and my own family's history with that community that led me to my first project was to go to Harlem and continue that conversation by making my own photographs there. And who did you think would see these pictures? Because this is not the same thing as just sort of making a personal album, you know, that you might share with family. At least I don't think it was for you. So who was going to look at these pictures? Where did you think they would go and what would they do? Hi, I'm so sorry to just briefly cut in. We're, we're noticing a bit of static. Um, Dawood, is there any way you happen to have headphones on you or maybe you can tilt whatever device you're using? Maybe there's something on the microphone. We've just gotten a few comments that, from audience members that the sound is a little bit staticky. Yeah, I, um, I had no idea who was going to look at these photographs. That was the furthest thing from my mind. Uh, I didn't even know how to make photographs. And that was the first challenge. So what I did, I was very fortunate that um, my father, every Sunday, he bought the Sunday New York Times, and I gravitated towards the art section. And uh, as you know, in the, back in the day, on the last few pages of the uh, New York Times Sunday art section, was a listing of exhibitions. And all the way down at the bottom of that listing, as a separate listing, was this thing called photography. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you, you remember this. And so <laughs> at the bottom. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't integrated into the rest of it. There were, you know, museums, a few galleries, and then down at the bottom, this thing called photography. And so naturally, I gravitated toward that. I'm like, oh, photography. I have this camera. 
I've gone to see this exhibition. Maybe I need to look at some pictures. And that was the mid 70s, 75, 76, 77. And from looking at the listings, I ended up at the Marlboro Gallery, uh, looking at photographs by uh, Urban Penn. And Urban Penn had his small trade exhibition up. Right. Uh, which of course was very fortuitous. These were ordinary people that he had brought into the studio to make photographs of. Uh, I went back to uh, see another show when I saw the listing back to Marlboro Gallery. And I have to tell you, uh, being a young black uh, teenager walking into the Marlboro Gallery was a pretty intimidating thing. I was going to ask you about that. That's not, that wasn't your place. <laughs> that was not your space. I'm sitting at the desk. No one said anything. <laughs> they don't say, hi, welcome. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Or even, good afternoon, how are you? Just a stony, a stony silence. Yeah, but it's still I, like that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I was determined to see these photographs. I didn't care whether these people spoke to me or said hello or not. I thought it was kind of strange that they didn't, but I began to get a sense that that was part of that institutional culture. Yeah. So I would go. I saw uh, Irving Penn, Small Trades. And then for the first time, I saw uh, Richard Avedon, uh, his portrait. Uh, different, of course, from uh, Penn, but uh, they had in common that they were pretty straightforward. They were photographs of people either standing or sitting and engaging the camera. And somehow, something meaningful could be drawn from that very fundamental relationship between subject and uh, between the subject and the photographer through the camera that left the viewer with some sense of the individual that they were engaging. And so I just started to look at a lot of photographs because uh, I was young, hadn't taken any photography classes, hadn't been looking at photography books. So that was the beginning of my uh, self-education, really. And, and then I went to uh, MoMA. Uh, I saw that there was a photography gallery in MoMA. And so I just started walking around. At that time, you could probably pay a quarter or 50 cents and walk around MoMA and stay as long as you want. And in the photography galleries, the thing that resonated for me were these photographs by a photographer I'd never heard of named Mike Disfarmer. Right. You know, and of all of the looking that I was doing, because I looked at Harry Callahan, I knew I was not going to make photographs of weeds of grass in the snow. I mean, I thought they were very poetic but it didn't seem like anything I would be interested in doing. So I think I was looking both for my subject, but looking for a conversation within the medium that I could attach myself to and bring my subject to that conversation. Yeah, let, let, let's go ahead to the Harlem photographs. Right. Because out of all of that looking, uh, and also, I stumbled across a copy of Ward de uh really foundational book, Sweet Fly Paper of Life. And these were a very different kind of photographs. They were much more, uh, I guess you could say, aestheticized. Uh, they were not direct portraits. There was obviously some other kind of uh, a different idea about photography but it also centered on the black subject. Uh, so De Kawaba became very meaningful to me as well and part of my early project of uh, self-education. Yeah, so now let, let's keep going into the picture. Right. So when you got to Harlem, uh, tell me about that experience. You're on the streets. Uh, in some sense, it wasn't your neighborhood, right? I mean, you did, that's not where you grew up. And I'm just interested in you as a young photographer, 
just encountering people, how did you talk to them? What did you discover when you started to shoot on the streets? What were those relationships like? Okay, let, let's move past this dick farmer. It's right. a dick farmer. That's he Penn. Small trade. And he right. did not enter the conversation. Uh, initially, uh, I actually spent considerable time in Harlem, uh, just walking the streets, getting to know the community. And I guess you could say also uh, allowing people in the community to get used to my presence. I had some intuitive sense that you couldn't just show up and start making work. Would that have been a political be awareness as well? It, you know, something of a Uh, certainly, certainly. I, I had a very clear uh, sense of uh, how images of African Americans uh, had been used or misused within both popular culture and uh, within uh, the larger visual culture. I mean, going all the way back to uh, you know, uh, 19th and early 20th century photographs of African Americans uh, that represented them uh, in a grotesque, uh, grotesquely stereotypical way. Uh, so I had a sense of uh, the ways in which uh, the Black subject had been visualized uh, in photography. I had certainly started looking at a lot more uh, photographs. And uh, I, I had a sense of what I wanted to do. I just didn't know how. I wanted to make what I thought was an honest uh, photographic representation of the of this particular black community. I mm -hmm. probably started initially with wanting to make a positive representation of the black community uh, as a way of creating something in opposition to the stereotypical and negative representation that very often cling to black urban communities. But confronted with the reality and the complexity of the community, that binary of uh, negative and positive, I, I just had to let that go and give myself over to the, uh, to the actual situation itself. So I spent a lot of time just getting to know people in the community with my camera hanging around my neck and not even making mm -hmm. any photographs. Kind of establishing my presence in the community as a photographer but not necessarily making any photographs. So that by the time I did start making photographs, if you take a photograph like this, Mr. Moore's barbecue, I probably waved hello to him through the window three or four times before I even stepped foot in that place. You know, uh, he might have wondered who this guy was that was waving at him, but by the second time, uh, he kind of recognized me by the third time he waved back. And then, you know, so I felt it was really important that there be, uh, that I establish a, a sense of familiarity with the community myself, uh, as well as allowing the community to get a sense of me. And I was also aware that even though uh, I was like the people I was photographing, uh, African American, by virtue of the fact that I didn't live there, I was right. an outsider. I was an outsider. I, I, did, I did not uh, want to work there under the pretense of being an insider. You know, I may have been racially and culturally. I, I was able to move around in the community with a degree of comfort. But I was also aware that 
the majority of people moving around in the community are not making pictures of ordinary people. Exactly. And, and yeah, people with the camera can be a very off-putting uh, thing. Uh, so eventually I just started um, asking people uh, if I can make a photograph of them. I was walking mm -hmm. to the barber shop uh, and just uh, tell them I'm, I'm making photographs in Harlem. You know, do you mind if I make some photographs of you? And, and then figure out how to, how to give that situation some kind of uh, not only resonant human presence, but some resonant photographic form. Because it's about making it's about making photographs, and I was always very much interested in those two things: making compelling photographs and also making compelling representations of the individual in the photograph. Yeah, and what's fascinating to me, and why I love these early pictures, is I see a, a, a young artist who's kind of speaking in tongues, right? And and I can see the images that you may have had in your head. I can see James Van Der Zee, and I can see Roy De Carava, and I can see maybe a little Gordon Parks. I can see all these different voices and, and others, right? Kind of circulating there as you, as you, may, as you look for the, the right pictures to make a good picture. And to me, it's, it's really, it's just great to watch you work in this, you know, I mean, it's almost like a snapshot of what's going on inside your head aesthetically. It's really pretty, pretty fantastic. I'm trying to find my language. Exactly. I'm trying to find my visual language. And if we go back, back up all the way to the first one of the man in the bowler hat, because right. there are, I like to say, keep, yeah, this one, this is, this is what I uh, often refer to as the first successful photograph I ever made. The first photograph that I made that realized the ambition that I had set for myself in making this work. This was the first time I was actually able to achieve it. And uh, it didn't come easy because I saw this man one Sunday morning and uh, I saw him from maybe halfway down the block uh, and he was talking to a group of maybe three other men, but I saw him and I knew that I wanted to photograph him I, you know, in all of his beautiful elegance. I wanted to photograph him, not the other three, but him. And I, had, uh, <laughs> and I, I wasn't sure how do you do this? Like, how do you insert yourself into a conversation with four older men? Because mind you, I'm probably 19 or 20 years old at this time, maybe 21. And this idea of interrupting a conversation that four adults are having and saying to one of them, I want to make a photograph of you. Not the other three, you, just him. <laughs> 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 you guys go away. Cut all your papers. Not, not, not you, but him. I, I didn't know how to do that. Which, which let me know from the outset that I was going to have to figure out not only the picture making part, but a very real social part. How does one socially insert themselves into someone's life and come away with something that doesn't have any sense of the disruption that that implies. Because he wasn't standing there waiting for me. He wasn't standing there waiting to be photographed. And then a stranger comes along and asks to make his picture. A young stranger, happens to be black, but still that's not why he's there. So I quickly realized that I was gonna have to figure out the social piece of this as much as the picture making piece because when i when i passed that group of four men i lost my nerve i i, I just said good morning i just said good morning to all four of them and kept walking and uh that was actually the moment that i had probably the first significant conversation with myself and i told myself if you're gonna do and be this thing that you say you want to do and be you're gonna have to figure this out because it's, clear, yep. it's, it's clearly more complicated than you thought it was. Yeah, the whole, 
you know. And so I turned around, stealing myself, trying to figure out how, how I was going to ask this man if I could make a photograph of him and not the other four. And I just quietly approached him. And I'm thinking, now you passed him by one time already. What are they going to think when you come back? This is going to look very strange. <laughs> but ultimately, I just walked back and, um, and I just fixed my gaze on him and we locked gazes. And I asked him if uh, I could photograph him. And then the next problem comes up. He says, yes. <laughs> he says, yes. What do you want me to do? <laughs> like, wow, what do I want him to do? I I'm clearly going to have to make this photograph with the man. He needs some direction here. What do you want him to do? And I told him, I'll well, just relax. Make and when, he, when I asked, when I told him to relax, this is what he did. Uh, and of course, there's always some lucky little grace notes that creep into the picture that you can't quite direct. You know, that beautiful gesture with the hand in the foreground, that was, that, that was all him. But this is the first time I was able to break through and do the thing that I said uh, I wanted to do. So this is my first successful photograph. Wonderful. Uh, there's two things that come out of this I want to ask you about. First, I just want to suggest, uh, it's a theme that I know is very important to you. We're going to talk about it a little later. And that is the other thing that's behind these pictures that I see in every one of them is this sense of place. As important as these people are, and as much as they live for me as, as someone who's never met them, uh, but I'm also intrigued by your sense that they exist in a place, and that place is loaded with history. It's loaded with, as it was at the time and always is, you know, what's going on at the moment. Uh, it's a place of history, but it's also a place of now. And that mm -hmm. joining of people and place, mm -hmm. is, that, is that a theme that is going to run through the rest of your work or so much of your work later on? It does, as I see it later on, especially more recently. Yeah, because uh, go, go ahead and flip through the rest of the uh, Harlem photograph. Uh, I noticed you change your camera as well, right? As you, as you move through Harlem, eventually you move to a Polaroid, right? You know, I'm, I'm making these very uh, deliberate photographs, working mm -hmm. with all handheld camera, 35 millimeter single lens reflex. But uh, I'm working in a way that's very deliberate in terms right. of uh, the framing. And I am as much aware of the, uh, the place and the space that wraps itself around the subject as uh, much as I am aware of their physical presence, their gestural behavior, uh, and not wanting, to, want, not wanting my presence to disrupt that. But this work is very much uh, about the idea of this place, this community. Uh, Harlem. It's about the individuals, but it's also an idea about a place. You know, so this idea of uh, place and how to work out my ideas around different kinds of picture making uh, with the black subject, along with these ideas about different kinds of pictures. Because, you know, a picture like this one uh, is very different from the one of the man uh, in, in the boulder. It's Absolutely. A spontaneous photograph. It's, it's a conversation with uh, a different photographic tradition. Yep. Uh, it's about everything to do with beginning to look at other photographs uh, in addition to uh, Walker Evans and Dorothea Lang, uh, the FSA and WPA photographers. That's a certain kind of picture making tradition. This is more Gary Winogrand. Exactly. It's got that <laughs> rhythm of those figures in the, it's a, it's a wonderful picture. It's a wonderful picture. Um, yeah. Yeah, because it's much about making certain kinds of photographs as it is making photographs of the black subject. 
and I'm and I'm very uh, consciously engaged in uh, both of those things. You know, this, this photograph, and and I increasingly, probably because of my uh, ongoing reading of uh, the history of photography, which begins to expand, and I'm looking at other kinds of photographs. Right. And, uh, I kind of want to be in conversation with this history mm. and, bring, and bring my piece of the conversation to that history. Um, let, let's see what the next slide is. Because you may have passed it. Yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah. So again, this is a very different kind of photograph. Uh, it comes directly out of uh, Roy de Carava. Absolutely. Uh, that, that photograph called The Graduate. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a young black girl in a white dress, and she's walking out of the shadow. My two boys are walking into the shadow. But this idea of light as an evocative element uh, becomes uh, something that I begin to pick up from Roy de Carava's photograph. And of course, Roy's early work comes out of Henry Cartier Besson's photograph this idea of gesture, timing, and improvisation, and then to wrap that idea uh, around the Black subject. But increasingly, starting with the more formal photographs uh, that I began making in Harlem, the photographs become more spontaneous, like this. And I go on to spend uh, a few years, I haven't included a lot of that work, making work within what we call that tradition of street photography in which one goes out into the world and tries to make spontaneous photographs, create a kind of spontaneous choreography, a visual choreography out of the ongoing rush and movement of the everyday urban environment and see if one can uh, make something coherent and perhaps poetic out of the chaos of everyday life. It doesn't normally uh, present itself that way, but if you can find a way through the photograph to take a piece of that, like this piece at this particular moment where there's this extraordinary kind of uh, momentary synchronicity between the elements in the picture. And so that idea uh, became something that I was increasingly interested in. So, you know, the, the photographs are always about ideas. Much, much like any, uh, I, I, I tell people, when, when, when you go to a museum and look at work, everything you see in there is the visualization of an idea. <laughs> you know, and for me, it's these ideas rendered in photographic form and using the black subject as the narrative anchor for that. You know, to keep the work fixed in a social place, even as it's about all of these making ideas as well. Right. Absolutely. Can you tell me about that shift you made? And this is kind of where I came into the game with you. Uh, this would have been in the 90s or the late 80s, where you started to make this shift into large format photography. You're doing everything sort of moves into the studio. You're doing kind of portraits that are multiply framed. Uh, you're also doing those really beautiful, elegant Polaroids, those large format 20 by 24s. You want to tell me about that shift? I think that's tremendously interesting. It always has fascinated me because you were such a good street photographer. I mean, you really, you can do it all. And, and yet you really changed your game when you moved into the studio and began to be super formal. Okay. Um, let's, let's go back and let me finish that thought and then we'll yeah. keep moving. But this is a photograph of a studio museum in Harlem. Uh, well, I presented that work when I completed it in 1979. Uh, studio, studio Museum in Harlem is on the second floor uh, in this building, above a liquor store and all these other small shops. Uh, and when I completed the Harlem USA work, I knew that I wanted to show that work in the community in which the photographs were made. You know, I, I wanted to situate the work in a very intentional way. You know, and this is a holdover from this uh, this conversation with the Met. You know that the absolutely, yeah, that the museum can be used intentionally. 
because otherwise I don't know what I would have done with those photographs. Of course, well, I was going to ask you that. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know what I would have done with them, but because I knew about the Studio Museum in Harlem and they were in the community in which I had been making work, I approached them with those photographs. But that's all part of one conversation because increasingly, as I go on to make work, the museum is very much uh, a part of the equation of the making of that work. It's not just the place where the work ends up. Uh, but anyway, yeah, let, let's, let's, let's keep moving forward so we can, uh, yeah, this more street photography. And then occasionally, even while I was making those kinds of pictures, those more spontaneous pictures, I would also make a picture like this, a more formal portrait, even right. though I'm still working with the small camera. But eventually, I stopped with a small camera and began working with a four by five camera on a tripod uh, using uh, black and white positive negative Hollywood film. Right. Uh, if you can go to the newspaper pictures. Yeah. And it's of course a very deliberate way of working with the, with the large format camera on a tripod. Uh, you know, there's not much room for spontaneity there. Although there is through the gesture another small mm -hmm. But the basic shape of the picture has to be figured out. And then you work with the subject to make the photograph. Now you, you can keep going. And so I spent uh, from 1988 to 1991 uh, making photographs in uh, various black communities, uh, beginning in Brooklyn, making these works that I came to call street portraits. And they're, they're about giving the, uh, the black subjects in the photograph a kind of performative space within this idea of uh, making a formal portrait in an informal environment of the streets. Mm -hmm. Very formal because it's a four by five. Uh, no one in any of these photographs were doing what they were doing before I approached them and asked them, could we make a photograph? So it's very uh, participatory. It's a very dialogical way of working. And, very much. Yeah, and what was important about this work too, the use of the positive negative Hollywood film allowed me to give each of the people that I'm photographing an instant four by five print of themselves in return for their participation. So it was a much more reciprocal kind of process because something, uh, I began to have ethical problems with this idea of making these spontaneous photographs of people in the street that the subjects themselves were never in possession of or never saw them. And I wanted to address that in some very real kind of way, even as I wanted to make a different kind of photograph. You know, making photographs at the four by five, uh, the film and uh, a view camera on a tripod uh, allows for a much richer quality of material description. Uh, and it also allows for the making of larger prints, which was another important thing because, you know, my work is pretty much from the beginning with a studio museum in Harlem. Uh, that's, those are the spaces that my work functions in. My work exists very much in a museum uh, context and then secondarily in a gallery context. So they exist in a very public kind of space. And I wanted to, in using the four by five and the large format negative and being able to make larger prints, give the subject an even greater physical presence in the space in which the work was shown 
to allow them to uh, inhabit the space uh, in a much uh, in a much richer kind of way. And also so, the idea of the gaze, you know, the gaze right. of the black subject towards the viewer uh, becomes very important uh, with the black and white uh, Port Award work as well. Uh, and that was just about being in various communities, seeing someone that I thought I could make a photograph with and asking them if they would be interested in making a photograph with me. And being able to tell them that I was going to give them a photograph at the end of that is so how, how did they respond? They must have loved these pictures. How did they respond when yeah. they got their pictures, when they were able to hold that picture that you gave them? I mean, yeah, that, 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 allowed, that, that allowed them to be much more comfortable mm -hmm. giving their consent to this man with a tripod and a camera disrupting them, taking up a few minutes of their time. Uh, but if I'm going to give them something, it's a way of giving something back to the subject who have given something to me. Uh, and of course, they, it, it, it was always interesting watching people look at their photograph. And I always told them, they would ask me, what are you going to do with these? I said, well, I, I, I exhibit them. I said, sometimes I publish them, sometimes not. Uh, but uh, they are going to be seen in a very public way. So there, there, there was no deception uh, uh, as far as that goes. And with, uh, with one interesting exception, uh, no one uh, ever objected to this idea that I was going to amplify their presence in the world uh, mm -hmm. by putting these large images of them on a wall in a museum or gallery. And now we're in the studio. Hmm. Yeah, we're in the studio. Were you thinking about painting when you were making these pictures at all? I was thinking about Rembrandt. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Not just painting. I'm thinking about <laughs> uh, I had to do a report on Rembrandt when I was in the sixth grade. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I went to public school in New York. Uh, and uh, somehow or another, I ended up having to do this report on Rembrandt. And uh, I fell in love with the work. I, I, I did the report and uh, never forgot the work. Yeah. And after, after several years of working with the Polaroid material in the streets, and after having worked in the streets making pictures from 1975 up until 1991, I, I decided I wanted to continue making portraits, but I wanted to find a different way into that conversation. I wanted to remove the narrative and the sociology of place and make something that was more resolutely about the individual. All of the time that I've been making the uh, Type 55 Call Award work, I have been doing that with the support of Call Award. Call Award had a program back then called the Artist Support Program. Yes, yes, very important. Yeah, you know about this. And they would send you uh, a case of whatever material you requested in return for one or two of the photographs that you made with that material uh, going into the Polaroid collection. And so that's how I was able to, as a young artist, uh, continue to make that work. That relationship with Polaroid led me to this work in the Polaroid studio. Uh, certainly I knew about the 20 by 24 Polaroid uh, camera. Uh, I had seen Willie Redmond's work made with this camera. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd seen Chuck Close's work. Chuck Close, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I knew about the camera. And uh, in 1991, having kind of exhausted a way of making photographs in the street, having gone from a spontaneous approach of the 35 millimeter to the four by five, but always in the street, 
I, I decided I wanted to uh, retreat from the streets and try another way of uh, making photographs. And so I asked Paula Ward if through that same program, the artist support program, uh, I could spend some time in the 20 by 24 Porter Wood studio, which of course was very, a very different experience from working in the street. It's a studio, it's a lot of backdrop paper, it's this huge 265 pound camera, and <laughs> the Porter Wood technician, and a bunch of lights, and you can do pretty much whatever you want. And so I thought about it and I said, hmm, maybe I can have that conversation with Rembrandt that started back in the <laughs> Let's bring him back. Yeah, yeah, Talk yeah. To him. Let's, let's bring Rembrandt back into the conversation. <laughs> uh, yeah, started yeah. working in color right. and uh, Rembrandt was that was the uh, initial, you know, uh, back, 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 back up, back up, back up, back up. Yeah, let's, let's just stay here for a minute. Uh, you know, that, you know, certainly the use of the brown, this deep, rich brown background, yeah. that's, that's totally Rembrandt, the singular light shot, and this amplification of the lone figure in the space of the studio, uh, the sustained looking at the subject, and the sense of uh, the sense of rich uh, psychological presence. Absolutely. Uh, that I, yeah, that I had identified uh, in Rembrandt's work. I, I wanted to bring uh, some of uh, that into the work that I was making uh, in the studio. And so I picked a day to start working, and uh, it required a very different uh, way of working in that everyone that I photographed had to be scheduled. And I have to think about, okay, how long is it going to take to do each one of these? Maybe an hour, hour and a half. So, <laughs> you know, I figure, you know. I used to working quickly because I worked in the streets. You know, I, I don't need a lot of time. I just need an idea. Uh, and so I would schedule one friend at 10, another at 11.30, another one at one o'clock. <laughs> you know, and they would come in and out of the studio. Uh, it was mostly artist friends of mine. Uh, the first one, go, go back to the very first one. Since I don't, I didn't put titles on these. Yeah, this is uh, yeah, this is the very first one that I made. Uh, an actress friend of mine, Cheryl and Bruce. Uh, go, 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 go ahead and scroll forward. Uh, this is a former classmate of mine uh, from Yale, uh, dancer and choreographer, uh, Trajo Harrell. Uh, another classmate of mine from Yale, Rebecca Walker. Uh, artist friend of mine, uh, Whitfield Lovell. Mm -hmm. it, it was basically my community, and I would just ask them to come to the studio and sit for a formal portrait. And, and then can... I was uh, pinning these up, because as you're making them, you have to pin them to the wall to dry. And you're kind of looking at all of them. And initially, I was looking at them the way a photographer traditionally looks at a contact sheet. You make a lot of them, and then you choose one or two. But scroll ahead. As I was doing that and looking at, let's say I'm looking at the one on the left, and I'm looking at the one on the right. I'm like, why do I have to make this choice about one or the other? Mm -hmm. Something more interesting might begin to open up if I keep them together. And maybe this will be an opportunity to kind of uh, expand and stretch this notion of time 
in the yes. still photograph. You know, this, this tension, like it's still, but it's actually about time. How can one represent time and multiple psychological dispositions in the photograph? And so I start to really begin to let go uh, of the single photograph, even though the quality of lighting remains the same, because I love that single light short. You know, it, it, it's very Rembrandt, it's very Caravaggio. You know, I, I love all of that work. Yeah. It's work that through the lighting has its own emotional quality. So I wanted to hold on to that and begin to uh, deal with both the gaze, this kind of awareness of the world and the viewer, and a second picture that was more inwardly directed and to put these two together in a way that suggested a kind of almost cinematic shift from one to the other. Okay, let's keep going. Yeah, it just, you're innovating all the time. You're changing the game. I mean, I know that, that John Coltrane was really important to you as a music, kind of as a musical and a creative influence. And I just see you, it, it's wonderful to watch you just push forward, constantly changing. You know, you're always looking for new ways to do, you know, whatever's on your mind. Yeah, let's, let, let's keep going while I'm talking. You can go through these diptychs. Mm -hmm. This is actually the last photo. Yeah, go to the next one. Not back, forward. There's, there's no, uh, there's no more. <laughs> That's the last photo. Okay, while they're doing that, I'll, I'll answer your question because, uh, you know, for me, I, I never think about it in an overly self-conscious way, i.e., let me do something different. Uh -huh. I, I, I get to, the, uh, to a place where I feel like I've answered a question sufficiently because part of making the work is asking a question, you know, what would it look like if I did this and used that kind of camera and turned it into a more reciprocal process as a way of subverting, you know, this notion of a singular ownership of the image. Okay, so that's the question. What would it look like? And then I, I set out to answer that by making the photograph. And then when I get to a certain point, I don't necessarily pick a number, but when I feel that I have explored that idea and mm -hmm. answered that question as far as I can, I feel like I want to give myself another challenge, but to stay within the broader frame of concern with that work is the portrait, the human subject, the black subject, uh, photographic representation around the black subject, and to think about the different ways photographically that I can engage that idea. So it went from the single images in the Port Award studio that were very much uh, informed and inspired and set off by Rembrandt's paintings. Uh, and then kind of secondarily Caravaggio. Mm -hmm. Because whenever, when I'm lighting a photograph, uh, I, I, I kind of say it needs more Caravaggio. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, not enough Caravaggio. <laughs> I don't want it to go too far. Right. You don't want it to turn totally yeah. dark. <laughs> you, you know, we, we, I know we're about to probably maybe move to questions from, from the audience, but yes. I, I really, we would be remiss if we did not spend a little time talking about some of the more recent work on the Underground Railroad, which for me has been uh, a total revelation that's been super important. I wonder if you could tell us how you made that move into a project which is very much all about a place or a route or a time and not about individual people at all. There are no people in those pictures and they're really dark. 
Well, if we can, uh, if we can get the images back up, uh, where are we with the images? I'm not seeing them. Is anybody seeing them? I think I think we reached the end of the slideshow, but we can pull them back up, or or we can go directly to the Q and A right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, put it back up. I, I need to go to the Harlem Redux photograph. Okay, Nico, uh, do you think you can pull it back up right now? Yeah, go ahead and fast forward. While they're doing that, all of these photographs, with the exception of the studio, and I keep keep going, keep going. We're going to get to the new work. They all have to do with a sense of place. So this idea of the narrative of place is always figured in the work. Even when I've gone into the studio as a way to consciously remove the narrative of place, it's about creating a different kind of space and place. But if we can uh, keep, keep going so I can get to Lyle's question uh, about the more recent work. Yeah, I'm not sure. For some reason, this, this group of images cuts off at, at this one and all that, all the subsequent ones uh, we don't see. I don't know how that, whether that's a different PowerPoint or. Do we have the other images or? <laughs> if, I've got them. If you, if, if you'll let me share my screen, I can bring them up. Uh, Sophia, do you want to give permission there for Lyle? Uh, I thought, oh. yeah. Um, the image that we, the slideshow that we have ends, ends right there. But if you have more images, maybe we can, maybe we I can. I got them. I definitely got them. Sophia, how, how would you like to do that? Oh, Lyle, you should be able to screen share now. Fine. Good. Cool. Okay. You guys can see that, I assume. So let's go big. Or bigger. Why are we not going big? Ah, there we go. I'm gonna run down here. So you were talking about Harlem Redux, which I think is a super important series of pictures. Yeah, keep That's going a back to uh, Harlem Redux. Okay. Yeah, we'll let this go to. Uh, I just gotta run it, run it down here. For some reason, it's a little slow. Come on. Sorry about this. It's just, it's a big file, so. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, okay. Let's take. Um, this was one of particular, see how this comes up. Oops. Sorry about this. I don't know why things are slow here. There we go. You see that one? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so. Okay, we, we, we can start here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had um, over the years uh, visited uh, Harlem periodically. And Harlem has undergone 
uh, several different ways of gentrification. And the most recent wave of gentrification uh, having to do with uh, the increased, uh, increased, the increasing influx of global capital uh, into the Harlem community and how that is reshaping uh, the community, how it is reshaping the community socially and physically, and how it's reshaping the sense of space and the narrative of space and place uh, was increasingly uh, apparent to me. And I wanted to make some work about that. I, I felt it was really important to try to figure out a way to insert myself uh, into this conversation about the way in which uh, Harlem was undergoing a uh, rapid change. And so I, from 2014 through 2017, uh, I, spent, <laughs> I spent considerable amount of time uh, going to Harlem, trying to figure out how to visualize, to figure out a formal language and a conceptual language for talking about this change. And what I didn't want to do was to make something that might be contemporary portraits of Harlem. You know, to continue the idea of the portraits in the contemporary moment, I needed to show how space and place itself was being disrupted. And uh, also because it's a very contemporary set of circumstances, I wanted to make this work in very vivid color. I didn't want it to have any of the tinge of nostalgia. Right, absolutely. Yeah, the black and white can sometimes uh, imply. So these are the photographs uh, from the project that became uh, Harlem Redux. And I spent, uh, I, I completed this project in 2017, but it is the work where I began to grapple with the formal visualization of space. Uh, it was very difficult work for me to do, quite frankly. I, I can see the difficulties, and I can see you trying to position yourself. And you move around into such odd places, like shooting yeah. around corners, shooting up at buses, doing all those things that you never did before. And... Sure. and uh, did you feel did you feel a sense of loss when you came to Harlem or change or I mean did you feel like you were a lost person suddenly in this place? A sense of loss, a sense of anger, uh, a sense of ambivalence, and uh, having to channel all of that through a particular visual strategy and visual. Uh, yeah. It took me about a year and a half to figure this out before I finally was able to make the kinds of photographs that I wanted to make consistent uh, for the project. Yeah, I mean, you know, see, this is your a kind of autobiographical shot right here. This is like a picture of you, right? How do I look? How do I see this? How can I possibly see this now? It's really amazing. It's an amazing picture. They're, they're all really quite, quite moving, I find. Yeah, because one of the things that began to happen, if you click on the next uh, slide after this one. That one? You want to go jump to that series? Because that's obviously the, the crucial one for me. Yeah, the, the one after this, this, this idea that uh, space and place is being disrupted and that places begin to open up where something used to be. And once it has disappeared, you almost can't remember what had been there previously. Mm -hmm. And the work is also about the way in which place memory is being uh, disrupted uh, for those people who have lived in Harlem for a long time. Go and back. watching all of these spaces and places 
that they knew by which they mark their lives is disappearing around them. So it's, it's about a, a kind of displacement as well. And uh, I wanted to visually uh, and photographically uh, talk about that. And, and that le leads us to this final series, which I, I wondered, are we, Go ahead, are, we are, are we okay for just a few more minutes? Because this is a, a really a tremendously important series of pictures. Um, one that, that gathers so many things together from all the work that you've done. I wonder if you talk about these pictures of the Underground Railroad. They come, the, the, the series comes from, um, actually the title comes from that great poem of uh, Langston Hughes, Dream Variations, uh, with a line that goes to fling my arms wide in the face of the sun, dance, whirl, whirl, till the quick day is done, rest at pale evening, tall, slim tree, night coming tenderly, black like me. And that is, is, you borrowed that line, night coming tenderly black, for the title of this series, which is about the Underground Railroad. And would you just tell us a little bit? Just yeah. really quickly, Lyle, I think we need to move forward on the yeah, slide. So yeah, that's fine. Can we get that work up? No. Yeah, it's up. Uh, I'm I not did, sure. I don't think it's up on our okay. screen. It's not up on your screen? Mm. Ah. Yep. That's funny, you should have seen everything. Uh, where, where did we stop? Okay. Uh, I believe we are seeing slide 55. You're seeing slide 55, okay. Um, uh, yeah, just there we go, there we go. Okay, that's what you see, right? Here, I think, yeah, now we're good. And you see that? You yeah. see that? Okay. At least we'll, we, if we can do it that way, then that's fine. Yeah, okay, so this work, which has to do with uh, finding a way to visualize the past and the contemporary moment comes also, it comes out of two things. It comes out of my understanding of how to uh, visualize space and place and the landscape that began with Harlem Redux and it also comes conceptually out of the Birmingham project, which is also uh, about the past and making work about the past in the contemporary moment. The Birmingham project, of course, did that while still remaining anchored to the portrait. Right. With night coming tenderly black, which is made in our Northeastern Ohio, and it's a project that I did for the Front Triennial. Uh, it is, it is a, a way, it's in a way a tribute uh, to uh, Roy de Carrago. Because when you think about uh, blackness in the photograph and blackness as narrative and the black subject uh, embodied in a very dark photographic object, you know, that puts me in the mind of Roy de Carrava, that the photographic print can actually be a material equivalent for the experience of the Black subject. So when I was invited to do uh, make work in Northeastern Ohio, and you can keep scro scrolling through. Sure. I, I took Langston Hughes, the last uh, refrain from that uh, poem, Night Coming Tenderly Black, because certainly in De Carabas' photograph, the, the, the prints are very rich, they're very black, but that blackness is not a threatening place. It's an embracing place. It's a space through which the black subject moves, much like the darkness of night through which those escaping fugitive slaves uh, were moving along the, uh, the Underground Railroad, thinking about the cover of uh, darkness and the blackness of night as enslaved people 
made their way through that blackness to freedom in Canada. So I wanted to make something that was uh, the material and narrative equivalent of that. Uh, let's go to the next one. And the, I have to say that the, uh, it, it's very difficult to tell from these images on the screen, but the prints themselves are much, much darker than these. <laughs> uh, uh, so they're made at different times of the day and then printed to feel as if they were made under cover of darkness. Yes. But I'm very interested now in this idea of how to bring pieces of significant African-American history back into a contemporary conversation uh, through my work. And this work, Not Coming Tenderly Black, uh, continues that. You know, they're very large scale because I want them to have a, a very real sense of uh, physicality that the viewer can almost immerse themselves in. I, I want them to move from merely being photographed to being experienced, you know, because, the, you know, a small photograph is a certain kind of photographic object and it never loses its, uh, its kind of... Uh, this preciousness. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's preciousness as an object. These are very large because I don't want them to be viewed only as objects, and they clearly are photographic objects, but I want them to have the weight of experience. I, I want you to be able to feel yourself physically moving into the space of the photograph. So maybe we can kind of conclude by going through the rest of these images. That's the last one. That's, okay. Yeah, and I think it's fitting too. That's uh, Lake Erie. You, know, you can imagine what it must have been like to come to the shores of Lake Erie uh, after traveling up from the south. It's an incredibly moving picture. Um, and I've been thinking about it a lot since I first saw it. Yeah, because 50 miles across is uh, Canada. It's Canada, exactly. So this, this is like the last view on American soil that enslaved people making their escape to Canada and a presumed freedom. This is the last view that one would see on this side. Absolutely. It's a, it's a wonderful place for us to kind of conclude if it's a, there's a chance to, to take any questions, um, uh, Madeline. Yes, uh, yeah, we've, we've had a pretty, pretty robust group of, of questions today, if you guys feel comfortable transitioning to that now. Um, this was so wonderful, thank you both. Um, I do think because of time, we just have time for three, uh, but so everyone, there will be a record of this chat and I just wanna thank everyone who did ask a question today. Um, I was really, really grateful to have everyone's thoughts here. Um, first, I'm going to go to David, and David, uh, I'm unmuting you right now if you'd like to ask your question to Dawood. Oh, sure. Great. Hi. Uh, hi, Dawood and Lyle. Really hey. great to hi, David. see you guys. How are you? Um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Really nice to have this conversation between you guys. And um, Dawood, I wanted to ask, we've touched, on, we've touched on this a little bit when we met. But I wanted to ask what the experience of getting your MFA at Yale, um, what, that, what that did for you as an artist, um, what the experience was like, what the community, what you encountered there, and, and how maybe it changed. You're, you're laughing, you're laughing and laughing. <laughs> but how it changed, did it change how you felt about yourself? You know where I met you, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. That's where it's coming from, man. <laughs> yeah. so it, 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 it's an interesting question because uh, I, had, I had my 
exhibition at Studio Museum in Harlem in 1979. Mm -hmm. And I went to grad school uh, at Yale for my MFA in 1991. I'm not gonna try to do the mental math, but that's a few years. And quite frankly, when I started making photographs, uh, the whole MFA question, I, I would say at the time I started making work in New York, the uh, academic art industry hadn't quite kicked in yet. Mm. Same for photography. Uh, the whole MFA, BFA, it, it didn't uh, exist. And my first academic experience was actually at the School of Visual Arts. Uh, I took the first group of pictures that I had started making in Harlem and used those to apply to the School of Visual Arts. Uh, I got a full scholarship to SBA, stayed two years, but I wanted to get back out and continue making my work. Certainly, uh, you know, no one that I studied with at SBA had an MFA. You know, that, 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 was, uh, that was not something that anyone thought about. Back then, you found yourself a mentor or you apprenticed to someone and you made your work. But uh, those two years at SBA proved to be very important in terms of expanding my community. Because at that point, my community of artists was probably limited to the people I had started meeting at Studio Museum in Harlem and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture also in Harlem, mm -hmm. a very uh, active exhibition program. Mm -hmm. uh, going to SBA introduced me to another community. Uh, I would say primarily to one of my teachers, Larry Siegel, who had founded mm -hmm. the Midtown Wide Photography Gallery. Uh, and I started frequenting the Midtown Wide Photography Gallery and met Michael Spano and start, started to meet a whole other community. And so I became increasingly aware of the community that attached themselves to certain institutions in a way that I hadn't before. Uh, with Studio Museum, it was largely a social thing. That, that's where people like me hung out. That's where Black people who were artists found each other. Uh, but uh, I don't say that passingly because institutions uh, are hugely important to the formation of communities. You can't form a community by standing on a street corner. Maybe by happenstance you'll bump into a friend or two, but in terms of forming communities, uh, institutions are important. So the first time I became aware of that, uh, because it expanded my conversation was at the School of Visual Arts. And then I left SBA halfway through, went on to do um, my work uh, in Harlem and went on to do the other work that I was doing. And then friends of mine started to tell me, Daoud, you should think about uh, an MFA. Uh, the first one who told me that was Carrie Mae Reams. Uh, we had been friends from Studio Museum in Harlem since 1976. And Carrie said, you should really think about going to grad school. I'm like, why would I want to do that? I'm, I'm making my work. Uh, and then another friend, a former classmate from a uh, school of visual arts, uh, Lona Simpson. Lona said, yeah, you should think about grad school. All of a sudden, people start talking about grad school. Uh, <laughs> And at that time, uh, Lorna, Carrie Mae, Louise Stern, uh, another former SBA classmate friend, uh, Albert Chong. I don't know if you guys know Albert Chong. They all went off to UC San Diego. Uh, UC San Diego was recruiting quite heavily. So friends of mine left me in New York and started to go off to grad school. Uh, 
and I was still working, still showing pretty much any time I, I applied for a regional fellowship, whether it was CAPS in the early 80s or New York Foundation for the Arts. I mean, I was a very diligent worker. I always had new work to apply with. So I tended to get fellowships whenever I applied, and I thought, I'm, I'm doing OK. And then Carrie May said, no, but you should, you should really think about grad school. And while I was thinking about it, Lorna came back. Because as, as we know, an, an academic uh, period in grad school, it's two years, but it's actually 18 months. It goes by. Mm -hmm. and so, in my work, my friends had gone to grad school and come back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, maybe I should think about, maybe I should think about this grad school thing. I wasn't interested in going to uh, UC San Diego or Cal Ops. Uh, the West Coast is very theory driven. Uh, I was not a theory queen, and I'm not a theory queen. Uh, I don't come from that. Uh, I come more from uh, theory comes out of the work rather than being imposed on the work. You make the work and then figure out where in the conversation uh, that work, continue the conversation. But as my friend uh, keep, kept coming back from grad school, I, I had to think about it. And I, I think it was Carrie May who explained it to me in terms of just expanding expanding your community. And by then I was already very good friends with Abe Morel, Mike Spano, Ray Williams, and I mean a number of friends who had gone to Yale, uh, going all the way back to the late uh, 70s. And then Michael told me I should think about it. Michael Spano, you, you should think about grad school. And one of the things that I did notice at that time, even though uh, I had had a show at the Fire Art Museum, I was, you know, I was, I was working, doing things professionally, but I began to notice things like, at that time anyway, almost every photographer who had gotten a Guggenheim in the photography area came out of one institution. And it dawned on me that there was, I couldn't exactly put my finger on it and say what that relationship was. But <laughs> there was clearly a relationship between the photography program at Yale uh, and any number of other institutions. Uh, it, was, it was highly regarded. And I was also aware of the fact that all of my friends who had come out of that program had a very rigorous work ethic. I made a lot of work. They seemed to never stop working, which is something I believe very deeply in. Uh, and uh, my son had just been born. And I decided with my son being born, I'm either going to do this graduate school thing now, or I'm not. I had been quietly because I knew a number of art directors and doing some occasional editorial work. I had been earning my money by photographing art objects and doing installation photographs for museums. So, so I knew how to use the camera to make money uh, as well. But I, I decided to uh, apply to Yale. Uh, there was one fellowship in particular uh, that uh, I figured if I applied, I might be able to get it and the economic burden uh, wouldn't be uh, too much of a problem. Uh, and so I went for the interview and at the interview, I, I met Richard Benson. And I really, really liked Richard Benson. And uh, Richard Benson or Chip as we call him, clearly took a liking to me and I thought that this could be a good experience. And when somebody asked me, oh, yeah, when somebody asked me at the interview, why do you want to come here? 
I said, well, I guess I'm not going to know what I don't know until I come here. <laughs> that, that, is, that, is such, that is such a wonderful, wonderful answer uh, to that question. And now actually we have a question um, from our publisher, Fong. So this is actually, unfortunately, the last question that we have time for today. But Fong, okay. gonna... I, I, I could keep going, but I'll stop. <laughs> I think we are gonna we are gonna go to Fong right now and then uh, close with our our traditional poem. But Fong, I'm uh, I'm asking you to unmute yourself right now so that you can ask your question. Thank you, Thank you Lyle. This is amazing conversation. Thank you so much for being so open and honest about your work, your life's work, really, the beginning formation and whatnot. You mentioned um, earlier about Caravaggio and Rembrandt as you experienced early on when you were so young, nine years old, exposed to Rembrandt, it's no joke. And as you know, that Rembrandt never met Caravaggio, who's easily 20 something years older, but he did, he did see some Caravaggio work, which influenced immediately. My question is super simple. When I was in freshman year college, I took a photography class and I was asked to read Jean Genet famous essay, 1967, it's called What If a Rembrandt Self-Portrait Painting Torn Into Four Equal Pieces and Flushed Down the Toilet. <laughs> it's a very memorable life laughing because I, <clears throat> he and I may have talked about this once. It's a very simple uh, experience how Genet ex had sat across from the train an, an older man and all of a sudden the Russian up realization of decay, physical decay, you know, that have relationship to the last time he had seen self portrait of Rembrandt, because as you know, he died as a poor man after his son Titus died a year before him, and the second wife, Hendrik Stoffel, died just a year before him. He went bankrupt. So the point was that the vulnerability as an issue was the key to the late Rembrandt self-portrait. If you think the early one, when he made, was so proud. He was so incredibly proud of his skill, mm -hmm. especially with the treatment of Cariscura. So my question to you is that it, vulnerability is a very interesting subject, depend how we portray it. So I'm just saying that, that is there any, any of, of that issue, urgency, that sometimes you were thinking of Rembrandt, you would think about your own, particularly that subject mm -hmm. of this beautiful self-portrait that you did. Yeah, it's interesting because I think, uh, I think two things. Mm. Uh, I am acutely aware of the vulnerable position uh, that the person has placed themselves in, in allowing me to take a sustained look at them uh, through the lens, yeah. uh, without even knowing uh, what's going to come out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, without uh, too much uh, sentimentality, and because of my own politics and disposition, uh, I have never wanted to exploit that relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, out of that relationship, more so than vulnerability, I would say the thing that I am interested in in the portraits and looking at is the idea of interiority. Mm -hmm. You know, how to uh, give the impression not only of the physical person, not mm -hmm. only of the social being, because I think in relation to Black people in particular, they're often seen through a lens of uh, sociology, Mm -hmm. uh, while overlooking what I think is the very important quality of interiority. Yeah. That, that black people too, like all people, 
have rich interior lives and that they're complex beings because of that interiority. And so part of the challenge for me has been how to make that interiority momentarily visible on the surface. How to, how to construct uh, within the unnatural act of photographing someone intimately, which is very unnatural. Somebody comes, hi, you want to see it? And they put this machine between you and them. It's a very unnatural act. And how to not have that disrupt the thing that I'm looking for. How to create a set of circumstances so that that aspect of interiority mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to emerge. Kind of like how to, how to get out of my way. Mm -hmm. You know, how to have the camera be there but not being there, even yeah. though that's the instrument that they're engaging with. So how to set up a, cer a set of circumstances so that that aspect of interiority is able to come to the surface so I can make a photograph about that with the individual that I'm photographing. Thank you, it's perfect answer. Thank you. Thank you. Dawood and Lyle, thank you so much. I'm gonna be thinking about surface interiority uh, for a long time. Um, we do have a, a transition of, uh, a tradition, sorry, pardon me, of ending each of these daily talks with a poetry reading because when we were in the office during normal times, we would close each of our real life lunches um, with a poem. And we're really lucky today to have the poet Farnoosh Fati here to read. Um, so just to briefly introduce Farnoosh, she's the author of Great Guns and the editor of Joan Murray, Drafts, Fragments, and Poems. She's also the founder of the Young Artists Language and Devotion Alliance, and she's taught at the Poetry Project, Poets House, Columbia University, and Stanford Online High School. Uh, Farnish, we're really, really excited to have you here today to read. So I will hand it over to you. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, thank you everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Great. Thank you, Lyle and Dawood, um, for allowing me to close with a poem. Um, it was a privilege and really wonderful to be part of your conversation. Um, and thank you to, to Madeline and, and Fong and Anselm and everyone at the Brooklyn Rail for hosting. Um, I'm gonna read one poem. It's about four pages long, but shouldn't take longer than five minutes. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it's inspired by a song by the artist and musician Lonnie Hawley, and that song is called All To Be Rendered, um, which he also abbreviates as art, All To Be Rendered. Um, yes. <laughs> Wait, no, 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 sorry. I always get that wrong. Um, all art, all rendered truth, yes. The song's called All To Be Rendered, but um, ART, All Rendered Truth, is um, his it, it's what he has the acronym ART for. So this poem's called All to Show, um, and it has like a alternate title called Shepherd Pyro 2020. Um, okay. An angel's intestines light the way, a road whistled through a gap tooth, work, which is ceaseless wink, Cruel fingers, long and overflowing, appear at the exact moment of their flowering excerpts inside anuses, whose shepherd, stopping nothing, leaping to as if from a book about to suddenly shut, bent evermore, his size spotting his reflection, and his deepest bow offered him what? What she said was right, I'm very slow, not a problem, not a problem with me. I've gone unwedded 4060 into interpretation. There's very little room for perceiving. That's how obvious work is. But it is only, but it's like only the arms of soldiers hanging in the service closet saying, if he needs to work, he should. Listening to the cries of the world, I don't approve it. Braids swinging from the stage, eel receipts coming out the firehead, the stage from which they say a penny dropped from my height could kill a one. Such a height. I was right to be chanted by innocence because I made my way, the long way, with it alone. 
since what little I was taught was very bad. I look at my hands and don't see God. That's how dense I am. Life at its most glass-bottomed green. I'm not here to uphold a robust version of myself, since God is the evocation of whom it is effortless not to know how lonely they yet are. And that's how my life loved me. I still don't know. I was right to be changed with innocence as I made my way the long way with it alone, alone through grass among the deafest rhymes for boundaries, mother, father. Now I'm going to watch this poem burn all its virtues off its face. But what can you do for that? Wing dancing with only a swig from a goner's eye, swing dancing with a wig only. I have to ask what it is like. And for you, it is like everything. The stage has porcupines. Each one has a tiny show dog with a ribbon in its mouth winding through its quills and a master in parallel doing it too. Hair brushed from my face revolved a bookshelf onto a lion's mane full of gum and flip phoning blood spray from the ring, the ring a clown nose shattering at the end of whose sentence Mariah Carey bending over, setting off alarm in bonnet space, coke bubbling her collar lace, curling blood signature, life-spanning signatures. From all this burning backside on fire stands a shepherd, cocktailed, poking crutch through donut shade with rose watts for a tie and calls beyond profesh, ironing downstream what others call long distance and a hand ghostly as a note taken, a blink lowering from a spider's thong and the bill, the fire bill, will becoming more than good and door slams from behind made of 100% heaviest doll blink and roses and blowhole asides. It is a persuasion that I have to ask, what is it like assembling the crowd, the crowd of wounds gathers on a hand and in assembling makes an infant's face into which they crowd and drop their purple and rose gold hind changes and laughter fully into its story licks, lollipop to the forehead earth, reading, pressing lightning, flowering worms, bookworms, since reading for me is both, both and forth knowing and looking. And what have I come for? Space roses, rose wigs for newborns, makes that face wince. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Everyone, thank you so much for coming today. Lyle Dawu, thank you for an incredible conversation. And Sonish, what a, what a wonderful way to close. Um, and everyone, it's so nice to see, to scroll through and see this audience. Um, we're actually going to unmute every, or allow you to activate, activate your mics, I should say, so everyone can say goodbye. And tomorrow we have a great conversation um, between artist Anne McCoy and Susan Aber. So we'd love to see you guys here tomorrow, 1 p.m., same time every day. But yeah, everyone should be able to unmute themselves now if they'd like to say goodbye. Thank you, Dawood. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Dawood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dawood. Thank you, Dawood. Thank you, Dawood. Thank you, Dawood. Thank you. Lyle and Dawood, what an incredible Great job, Madeline. Great job, Madeline. Great job, Madeline.